The flow of lymph fluid happens in much the same way that blood thro flows through the venous system. And in order for that to happen, it uses some of the same mechanisms. So for example, the first is that there's this milking action of skeletal muscle that occurs, and that's gonna help return the lymph fluid back towards the heart. There's also pressure changes in the thorax during breathing. And specifically, this happens when you breathe in, so during inspiration. When you inspire, you're increasing the volume in your thoracic cavity, thus decreasing the pressure. So you're creating a pressure gradient where the lymph fluid can flow from lymph vessels, lymphatic vessels that are more inferior back towards the heart. The next thing is that there are valves, just like in the veins, that also prevent the backflow of lymphatic fluid. And there's other things like pulsation of nearby arteries that also help, contraction of smooth muscle in the walls of the lymphatics, and also physical activity can do this. And there are um, examples of um, massage therapists that can also do this, but they need to be very importantly trained on this. So our next slide is on lymphoid cells themselves, the tissues and the organs. So first of all, the cells are the immune system cells. And those specifically are the lymphocytes, one of those five leukocytes that you've learned. And these lymphocytes are part of the adaptive immune system, which we'll be talking about later. And the two types of lymphocytes are T cells, also called T lymphocytes, and B cells, B lymphocytes. So what these cells do is they protect against antigens, and antigens are anything that the body perceives as foreign. And this also applies to red blood cells because, for example, if you are type B, you perceive the A antigens as foreign. So examples of common antigens are bacteria, toxins, viruses, mismatched red blood cells, or cancer cells. And they're usually large molecules, but it's really anything that can irritate the immune system. So the T cells and the B cells are included. And the B cells, they produce plasma cells, which secrete antibodies. And we'll talk more about that later. So other lymphoid cells included are the macrophages. And the macrophages, they develop from monocytes. And they phagocytize foreign substances. And they also help to activate T cells. Then there are also dendritic cells. And dendritic cells, they capture antigens, thus delivering them to the lymph nodes. So the last supporting cell is more a structural cell that's in the connective tissue, referred to as the reticular cells on the reticular fibers. And what this does is it helps to form a stroma. And the stroma is this sort of network spider-like looking structure that acts as a support structure, a scaffolding, if you will, to help to catch bacteria, microbes, antigens, so the immune system can act on it. So lymphoid tissue, its job, first of all, is to house and provide proliferation growth for lymphocytes. It also offers a surveillance or vantage point. So in this case, those lymphatic lymphocytes and macrophages are looking around at the lymph nodes and other lymphoid tissue so that they can attack. There's also reticular connective tissue, a type of loose connective tissue that you learned about a long time ago. And specifically macrophages live on that reticular tissue. So other lymphoid organs are also found throughout the body. And there are diffuse lymphoid tissue this means it's found in virtually every body organ, with a few exceptions. And there's two types of lymphoid tissue. 
whether it be spread out everywhere or whether it's concentrated. And when it's concentrated, it's referred to as a lymphatic follicle or a lymphatic nodule. The two things mean the same thing. And it's tightly packed lymphoid cells and reticular fibers, which we will see coming up. So within the lymphatic or lymphoid follicle, there is a germinal center, that means growth, where there are proliferating B cells. And these specifically um, can be located in various areas of the body, but there are isolated aggregations, that means a large amount of follicles in the pyrus patches, which are in the small intestines, and also in the appendix. So in addition to this tissue, there are also lymphoid organs and the lymphoid organs are either the bone marrow or the thymus. So the primary lymphoid organs are those two that I just mentioned, the red bone marrow and the thymus. This is where these cells originate from. And the secondary lymphoid organs are going to be the areas that those cells go to once they are mature. So let's look at the lymph nodes next. And the lymph nodes remember, are the um, principal organs of the lymphatic tissue. They're the main secondary lymphoid organ of the body. So there's hundreds and hundreds of them found in our body. Most of them are embedded or located in connective tissue in kind of clusters along the lymphatic vessels. And I mentioned that they're kind of like the washing machines of the body. So they cleanse the lymph as it travels through the lymph node, therefore acting as lymph filters. So the macrophages remove and destroy microorganisms. And what would happen is if there's lymph nodes in a particular area that would have a backup of lymph in the vessels, it would be drained from the, those removed lymph nodes. So if there's a region of the body where there are removed lymph nodes, fluid would drain into that specific area. And we'll see that when we talk about circulation a little further. So the structure now of the lymph nodes, specifically, they are kind of all bean or kidney shaped. They're very, very small. And they have an external fibrous capsule. And those capsule fibers extend inward as what are called trabeculae. And there's two major parts, histological regions of the node. There's an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex is the superficial region that contains these growth centers. So the germinal centers are within these follicles. And those house B cells that are dividing. And therefore, they would be more visible during an infection because there are B cells that are dividing, getting ready to produce antibodies for that infection. Then the inner medulla has medullary cords in it that extend inward. So let's look at the structure of a lymph node. We can see a diagram of it on the left. So I just want to zoom in here so we can see some of it a little better. First of all, the fluid is going to enter via the afferent lymphatic vessels on the convex side of the lymph node. And notice there are more afferent lymphatic vessels than efferent lymphatic vessels, which are on the concave side of the lymph node. And this is a very important, there's a very important reason for this. It occurs so that the lymph fluid slows, it, it's slowed down within the, as it drains through the lymph node, so that those surveillance cells can look for possible antigens. So the outer region of the lymph node is the cortex, which is, has the lymphoid follicle, also called nodule, and the growth center of dividing B cells is in that. And there's a subscapular sinus, an enlarged area that is surrounding each of these lymphoid follicles. In the medulla area, there is a medullary cord and also a sinus. And the medullary cord acts as a network within the medulla. 
So now looking at the micrograph, which is something you might see in lab, notice the trabecula, the trabecula singular, trabecula plural, but these are um, coming off of the outer capsule, moving inward into the lymph node, and they divide into smaller compartments. And so the germinal center, as you can see in the outer cortex, they are pale stained cells which occupy the center of this follicle or this nodule. So for the circulation of the lymph node, just to review, the lymph enters the outer part, the convex side of the node via the afferent lymphatic vessel. It travels through the large subscapular sinus into smaller sinuses that are throughout the cortex and the medulla. So the lymph then enters the medullary sinus. And finally, it exits at the hilum into the efferent lymphatic vessels. And remember, the, the reason for this amount of larger amount of afferent vessels and fewer amount of efferent vessels is that the fluid then remains somewhat stagnant and allows the lymphocytes and the macrophages time to do their immune surveillance to do their function. So again, if lymph nodes in a particular area have a back of lymph in the vessels, that's because some lymphatic vessels or lymphatic nodes have been removed in that area.